Welcome back, you guys. Uh, anybody have any comments or questions or thoughts before I show you your video? Send a video for getting to class on time. Absolutely none. We had great attendance last week. What happened? This week, busy Monday maybe. Uh, you want to hit the lights, please? And uh, here's a video I saw, which I thought was pretty cool, which I'm happy to share with you guys. Hey, cool. Uh, you want to hit the lights there, please? Let's see. Let's try that. Here we go. What do you think? Thoughts, comments? Find it inspiring? <laughs> Uh, new ways to find all of our developing technology. Yeah, it definitely he is, right? Like that's part of, he runs that, that prize, uh, Active X or 10, whatever it was. Whatever he called it, $10 million. You could make a cell phone be able to diagnose people, create a handheld device that can diagnose people better than doctors can diagnose people. Definitely challenging people. But also looking towards the trend of how all of us coming together and the acceleration of technology yeah, is leading to uh, quite a huge amount of innovation which is going to be positive. 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 Um, really like his, uh, his metaphor of energy and there's tons of energy, it's just a question of accessibility. And at one time, you know, there's tons of silver but nobody knew how to get to the silver. But then, oh, now silk, not silver, it's aluminum. But now aluminum is completely, we make our soda cans out of it. I'd be like, can you imagine soda cans made out of gold? Like somebody discovered, oh, here's a really cheap way to make gold, and all of a sudden it's like they're making Coke cans out of gold. Yeah, but at one time silver was more valuable than gold. Right? The king of Siam would have been like, look at all the aluminum. I'm getting the words mixed up. At one time aluminum was more valuable than gold. I can't even get it straight in my head. I just want to say silver. Uh, what else? I like the slingshot. We talk about the slingshot. Uh, the nuclear water. Yeah. Less than two percent. Yeah, that's a big deal. Clean water. A lot of places in the world. I think technology is amazing. Innovation is amazing. It's an amazing time period that we live in. It's easy to take for granted. What else? I like the fact that then you mentioned them. I mean, maybe you would hear voices that you've never heard before. So it does, like, I think sometimes like, today we hear things from the party instead of hearing directly from the sort of person. So now we can actually hear from directly from the first person instead of the party. Like communicating with us. Yeah, when we were at Google, one of the things they talked about was programming with uh, the YouTube API. When we talk about programming, when you read that chapter, you'll hear. API's application programming interface. So Google makes these application programming interfaces, these APIs available, so programmers can access some of the power of what Google has to offer. And thus, it makes Google more valuable because a lot of people are using their tools and they have an entire business strategy around that. But the YouTube APIs, one of them was like for, you know, people could comment on on things that you put online, and then their videos get added, and then as the person who runs the website or built it, you can say approve, accept, reject, accept, reject. So those uh, those videos will just show up if you accept them in your what you present to the world. But you know all kinds of stuff too. So like Syria, you know, or uh, the conflicts recently. I can't think of them where people have been. Using cell phones, talking about what's going on, and YouTube. So hearing voices. Hearing. But, like along with the voices, though, it's cool. Because, like, not just him, but like how with the hackers, how it's like just these no name little people coming from like bad situations and they turn out to be super smart. And then with the oh, yeah. like the DNA and RNA thing and the whole yeah. folding, and it's like yeah. it's just some random lady in England. Yeah. So it's just like, it's interesting that all these different people who are really, really smart, but they're coming from backgrounds that we wouldn't expect it from. And it's just like, well then, how much emphasis are we gonna start putting on all these big colleges when we know that there's really smart people out there who don't even go to these colleges, who don't come from MIT or Caltech and stuff like that. So it's just like, 
So yeah, we're still gonna respect those people if they're really smart, but it's like, but you can't disregard other people who've never gone to college because obviously these people are really smart and they can do um, like amazing things yeah. better than people who do go to those fancy colleges. It's kind of like it's just continuing to like take away from however how highly we value like those type of degrees. It's like they're not that valuable anymore. Like that's not yeah. the only people who can do those types of things. Like everybody can, anybody can. No, I, I thought that was, thanks for pointing that out. I thought that was fantastic. Awesome. That was a really cool thing to, to see. Yeah, multiple intelligences, you know, and uh, just because you've gone to school and you've got a degree, that doesn't mean that you are quote unquote smart. And uh, some people are really gifted, maybe don't even know it, you know, uh, at working with things in certain ways. There's another video on intellectual property, a TED Talk. Um, I don't know the name of it right now, but this woman made this really incredible mix mashup of a video. And somebody asked her, my God, that's amazing. You do this for a living? Nope, I'm a housewife. <laughs> you know? So, as well as your passion, where you put your time. Hey, nice comments. Uh, more? Any more thoughts or reflections? Uh, welcome back here. All right. So some of the things that stood out to me, you guys saw Moore's Law on there, and Moore's Law is that theory, just as a reminder. What is it? Who can tell us? You tell me. What's Moore's Law? So there it is. That technology is like improving, like it's the, yeah, like every two years ish. Yeah. By like doubling, yeah. like the abilities and capabilities of it. Yeah. So technology, the processing power for your dollar doubles every 18 to 20 months. So it's better than every two years. It's every 18 to 20 months. And uh, here you can see the generations of computers: vacuum tube, first generation; transistor, second generation; integrated circuit third generation. Fourth generation would be the CPU. They're not breaking that out there. And you can even see representations. There's the vacuum tube. There's the transistor. I had to look down to make sure I was using the right word. And there is the integrated circuit. The, the chip. That's also called a chip. So I thought that was one of the cool things about this video. I'm just seeing that again. And then I liked all these things that you listed here. You know, all the different technologies that are uh, occurring. I don't know why he calls it infinite computing. It's really known as cloud computing. Maybe that's because the term was just coming into um, into uh, parlance, I don't know, into common parlance, right? Cloud computing. When he gave his talk, his talk's maybe a year or two old. We could look in a second. But uh, cloud computing, you know, uh, robotics, huge, right? Like, so it's, Technology doubles every 18 months. You know, what we're able to do with robots is amazing. Somebody showed me a video of self-organizing robots. Was that in here? My other class. You know, so there's a bunch of little robots, and when they can't do an, a task on their own, they kind of work hooked together sometimes to accomplish it so they can figure that out. You know, so if they are out in the field, several robots can come flying in and help the other robots do something, and then they fly off. Uh, 3D printing. 3D printing printers are now $2,000, right? So that's amazing that you could buy a 3D printer for $2,000 and they're not going to print you a Glock 9mm. They're at that, at that level of sophistication, but they could print you some stuff. I'm not quite sure how, how effective they are. You know, uh, artificial intelligence, nanotechnology. Nano just means really small. So I thought that was a cool little slide, just some of the things that are being impacted. And uh, this uh, was a pretty famous moment in the history of technology when a computer beat a human, humans, on, on Watson. And we've heard about, or on, on Jeopardy, we've heard about this uh, before because uh, this guy was like, one of these dudes was like, yeah, like yeah. won it like three trillion times or something. And, and, you know, he just got completely, you know, he had his lunch fed to him <laughs> by Watson, a computer called Watson. It's built by IBM. 
And then he also, in this video, he mentioned singularity. How many people have heard of singularity? All right, you know anything about it? Uh, I know that this one guy was like head of it, kind of, but it's yeah. kind of just like how yeah. saying like in the future, eventually, like humans and technology are gonna like merge into yeah. one. Yeah. Because yeah. it's gonna be so advanced. So it's just an idea that's out there, singularity. And if you go to YouTube, and uh, there's actually a movie, Clarity, trailer, singularity. I don't know which. Which one would be Singularity? So there's a game apparently. Now oh, here we go. Documentary trailer. Singularity documentary trailer. So this is just, I'll just uh, share this with you so uh, you guys are up with it. But it's basically humans and technology merging. So this one guy who uh, has made millions of dollars and invented a bunch of stuff uh, says, you know, uh, hey, that time's coming where we're going to be merging more and more with machines. And you see that some. So you see that with the interfaces, right? You see that with how we use technology, or does it use us, how connected we are to it? Uh, you know, we're carrying it around, it's tracking us. Uh, pretty soon it could always be recording us with Google Glasses or Google Goggles or, or Golden Eye, which somebody, My Michael? Yeah, you know, Michael shared with me today just a moment there where it's like, wait, is that right? And uh, you know, and then we, we pacemakers that are Wi-Fi connected, you know, and growing organs, right? Uh, printing organs, like all that stuff. So hit the lights. So we'll, it gets a little bit weird at the end, the movie, where it gets a little bit like, okay, they're kooky. But just so you're aware of this, what this is, here's singularity. All right, wasn't that great? That was a good video, so I'm glad you guys like that. Huh? Say that again? They did get a bit oh, it got a little kooky at the end. Yeah, we'll just pretend like we actually watched it so that I don't mind seeing it. Go ahead, turn the lights back on. We'll see if that fires up in a second. Um, he mentioned in here at one point DIY. How many people have heard of DIY? So you hear that kind of home improvement. DIY is do it yourself. And there's actually a really cool TED talk, which uh, I'll show you. Uh, TED, Civilization. Starter kit. So there's a TED talk on the Civilization Starter Kit. So uh, this guy here, uh, basically, you know, the basic tools you need to create a civilization. He uh, figured out how to make them really cheaply with commonly available parts, and he put out the blueprint diagram so you could go download it from his his uh, website. So he's got like all kinds of interesting stuff. So turn the sound off and that one's not loading either and wow dude is YouTube having problems or is it us probably it's us <laughs> All right but uh, how to make a tractor you know for like six thousand dollars as opposed to seventy five thousand dollars and stuff like that so if you are a developing nation you could build these tools to really do modern agriculture and farming and things like that for a lot less money so DIY is do it yourself I thought this was an interesting picture right here, because this guy here, this is just kind of like a humorous anecdote. Dude, it's Don Cheadle. Doesn't it look like Don Cheadle? Yes, uh, up here, the resolution's better. But it's like, hey, it's Don Cheadle. And then, uh, like uh, this, this is a cool statistic. There's just gonna be a lot more people coming online. Like, we've passed seven billion already. Do you know when I was born in 1971, there was only 3.5 billion people on the planet? Like imagine Fresno with half as many people, the mall with half as many people, the roads with half as many people, right? Like that's kind of crazy that there was just half as many people 41 years ago. No, not crazy for you guys. Yeah. And then also thank you for pointing out that thing about the lady, the secretary. That's the other point I want to make. So. Just some cool stuff. Okay, so uh, your are you here? Your is not here. Cause he had a question about how to do something, but 
I guess I can't talk to it. Um, the other thing I wanted to uh, see with you guys is how you're doing with the entire um, uh, uh, coding schemes, right? So coding schemes in relation to like uh, pictures and sound and 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 video. And so last last week. Um, I used a word that, in retrospect, I wish I hadn't used. And um, I appreciated somebody pointing it out to me. And in my other classes, I changed that, right? Because I said, you know, I don't want you guys to look like idiots when you go out into the world. And so somebody shared with me, that's not the best word to be using in relation to, to students. And so I apologize for using that word, and I appreciate you pointing that out to me. And it's definitely impacted my delivery and in my uh, Tuesday Thursday class I said to them I said uh, I don't want you guys I want you guys to be as effective as possible as you can when you get out in the world you know and I thought that's a much better way to phrase it and uh, so I apologize for that because I don't think you all are idiots I absolutely do not think you're idiots and also in that same class when this occurred last Wednesday I, I, I was I, at the beginning of class I was advocating that you could do anything you want put your mind to it. And then that came back at me. You guys were like, somebody was like, well, go. you can do anything you want. Go play in the ML Major League Baseball. I was like, no, it's too late for me. But I, I do believe that uh, you all have the potential to do whatever you want with your life. And that, you know, amongst each of you, this group, there could be the person who's the genius when it comes to, you know, doing the protein folding or when it comes to making amazing videos. Oh, no, I'm just a housewife. So uh, thanks for that feedback, and my apologies for using that word. I, it's not what got conveyed isn't what I believe, and uh, what I what I believe is what I articulated at the beginning of class, which is you guys can do anything you put your mind to. It's just that focus, applying yourself every day a little bit, you can get where you want to go. And then when I talked to my Tuesday Thursday class, I was like, how many of you all uh, know what coding schemes are? And again, only one person knew what that was. So that's telling me two things. One, it tells me that uh, uh, that a topic, well, it tells me that topic need to be covered a little bit more, but it also tells me that we need to sort of come together to make sure we're learning what we're learning, what we need to be learning in this class. And so there's a couple of things that you guys should be leaving with in this class. So as students in here, just so we kind of take a step back and see the lay of the land, and we're looking at the overall game plan as opposed to just like getting down and looking at each little section, like, oh, look at the trees here, look at the trees here, look at the trees here, chapter 12, look at the trees here, chapter 13, right? This is what they're like in 12, this is what they're like in 13. We're pulling back and let's look at the whole forest. And we, right now we're in week what? I asked you this last week, didn't I? And I asked my students, I don't know what week we're in either. I think it's week 12, week 11, it's week 12, I'm pretty sure. I know how we can find out. You know, if YouTube is working. All right, we are in week 12. Right, so are the videos for week 11. So we're in week 12, there's 18 weeks in the semester, which means that we are 66% of the way through, two thirds of the way done, or two thirds of the way done. So we've got one third left. And uh, looking at some of uh, your progress in the course, some of you are doing fantastic. You've been knocking it out in my IT lab, and you've let me know you, you've done your assignments, you've, you've done your quizzes, and uh, you know, what else is there? You have good participation, and I'm missing one thing. My, my IT lab participation, uh, quizzes, assignments, and final, that's it. So some of you are doing really well, but some of you need to, to jump on and get a game plan together so that you can get through the course. So there's two goals. Two goals that you want to get out of this class, right? You want to pass, get a good grade, all right? And then the second thing is, is you want to acquire a certain amount of knowledge so that you can be as effective as possible when you get out in the world, right? So you can be as effective as possible when you get out in the world. So, uh, those, those are the two things. And then, and then, and then also in there is uh, part of that being as effective as possible when you get out in the world is more like, I, I like the social philosophical 
technological aspects of how are we using technology? Is it using us? What is the cornerstone of technology? It's innovation. In what ways are we stuck inside our own box and we, we aren't even aware of it? Because innovating is really what it's all about, looking at something and saying, hey, how can we do it differently? So gathering that skill set to just look at things and question it and ask if there's a better way to do it, that's huge. That's huge. But then there's also a lot of the technical details. So I don't have time to teach you everything in this coursework. I don't have time. I can't do all the work for you. And uh, the key terms that I hand out, those are, those are absolute need to know. Okay? So make sure you're looking them over. And uh, you know, if you have questions about them, come back. Let me know. And we'll, we'll go over them. Um, but I think I uh, encourage you to do this last week. It's just to review all the ones you've gotten and see if there's stuff that don't make, doesn't make sense to you. And then look it up. But, so that, that's kind of like the lay of the land. You need to get a good grade to pass, and then there's some valuable information in here to help you succeed in life. Help you succeed in life, and that's the stuff that needs to be learned. So does anybody have any questions about how that's all unfolding? Or how many people feel like they know what they're doing and they've got a good game plan? Let me see your hand. Okay, so uh, where are you at with uh, coding schemes? One of the things that came, came into my awareness on uh, Thursday was that coding schemes was getting confused with programming, which sometimes is called coding. So there's coding schemes and there's programming coding. Like coding the, a program, you could call that coding. As a matter of fact, there's this guy who's such a hardcore programmer and president, he named his kid Coded. Coding. So why you are our, our programmer. Alright, so there's coding and then there's coding schemes. So um, we did go over last week a little, kind of how how we do that with pictures, right? You guys how many people feel secure like oh I know how that that works? Coding schemes with images. How many people can use a little bit more and need to kind of get that concept still? Okay. All right, cool. So, um, with text, right, it all comes back to the zeros and ones because computers run on electricity. electricity. So if we have one light bulb or vacuum tube, we could store two messages, right? <coughs> and, uh, and so if we have two light bulbs, we could store four messages, because light bulbs could be on, off and off, or on and on, or off and on, or on and off. And we could say, hey, that equals A, that equals B, that equals C, that equals D. So we can do that. And we could also just as easily say that instead of those zeros and ones equaling A, B, C, or D, in which case if we were to store, oh, I'll leave that for a second, if we were to store, like if I hit A in the computer using this coding scheme which I just created, and there's coding schemes that people have created, just created, right, they created them, and they're widely used. And it's arbitrary. Ultimately, language is even arbitrary. Why do we use the letters A, B, C, D, E? Like, that's kind of the amazing thing about some knowledge is we have learned it so deeply, we just think that's the way it is. No, that's not the way it is. We could even change that if we wanted. And other cultures learn completely different things. Cyrillic, Chinese characters, Japanese characters, Korean characters, crazy characters, crazy sounds. The way they write down symbols to represent objects is completely different. So 
here, people have created coding schemes, ASCII, A-S-C-I-I, FCDIC, and Unicode. The most widely used today is Unicode, is Unicode. Originally, these coding schemes are like 8-bit and then 16-bit. Unicode is 32-bit. So 32 zeros and ones are used to represent a single letter. <laughs> and with 32 zeros and ones, we can represent all the characters of all the alphabets all around the world. Right? So this series of zeros and ones represents the Chinese character for, um, for busy. You know what the Chinese character for busy is? It's a heart. It's the symbol of a heart. And killing, the symbol for killing. Busy is heart killing. That's the Chinese symbols for, for busy. I'm 98% sure I heard you know what tolerance is, or patience, I can't remember which. It's a knife over the heart. That's kind of interesting, right? Because to, to tolerate is kind of like, it feels like uh, I'm tolerating it, I'm tolerating it. It feels like a knife over your heart. So Unicode can represent all the characters in the world. So that's text. That's how you hit the letter A. You know, this is what goes into the computer. Right? And then I hit the letter C, that gets stored. And switches actually get flipped within the computer to store that information. And then we can look back, oh, what did he type in? He typed in <coughs> A and typed in B. So that's how we store text, when people enter text into the computer. That's a huge part of computers. And it's all because they run on electricity. Okay, well, that's great. We've got a way to store, in, which is to store data, text data. We have a way to store text data. How do, we, how do we store image data? How do we store image data? That's cute. I want a large one now. Ah, that's cool. Okay. How do we store image data? So a couple things are uh, a couple things are happening here. First, we have resolution. And resolution is <coughs> on this picture 1776 by 1753. See that? That's the resolution. Okay? So there's our resolution. And what that means, and then there's something else. And then another this uh, other thing is pixels. Uh, so it's these are pixels here. Just thinking about pixels. And pixel stands for <coughs> picture elements. Picture elements. That's what a pixel is. And so they're the elements that make up a picture. And those are the little squares. When I had you guys come up and look at the screen, this whole screen is made up of little squares, uh, little images. They're pixels. So our resolution is how many pixels by wide by how many pixels tall. And that, that becomes our, uh, our resolution. So the next question is, okay, if we have a grid, if we're going to map those bits, right, if we're going to map those bits over a grid, we just need to remember what each, what each pixel, what color it is. We need to remember the color of each pixel. So we could 
give x, y coordinates, like in so many different things, uh, with examples of which I could not find any right now. x, y coordinates like in math, I don't know, right? Point x2, y3, 2, 3 takes you to a point on the x, y axis, and that's that one point. Well, we could do that here. We could say all these different pixels each have a point. This one is going to be, you know, x, you know, 242, y, 110 or whatever. And that's that one pixel right there. And that pixel's color would be this, right? Obviously, I made the circle bigger than the actual pixel, just for example. And then this pixel will be that, right? And then this pixel will be that color. And then this pixel will be that color. And so over here, instead of saying 0, 0 equals A, Uh, we can say zero, 0, equals yellow. And we can say zero, 01 equals pink. And we could say this equals tan. And we could say this one equals brown. Okay. And so right here, this would then be, this one is yellow, so it would be zero, 00. Right, that, that would be the, the binary that we'd store. The pink would be 1, 1. And tan would be 0, 1. And brown would be 1, 0. So we do that with every pixel. And that's actually called mapping bits. And that's where people, that's where we came up with the phrase bitmap. And bitmap is actually even a file format that you could save save images under bitmap right so there's different file formats for saving images and these are these are under a category called bitmap images right so it's all in the same category including bitmap is one in the category of bitmap but jpeg png gif these are all bitmaps and they 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 are different than vectors so vectors are images where they're mathematical formulas. Like if I have a formula for a circle, like no matter how much I zoom in or zoom out of that circle, the computer just recalculates the formula for a circle and redraws the circle. Okay, so that's a vector image. So it's not storing, you know, exactly where each bit, what, what color each pixel is. It's storing just this formula, which it calculates and then fills in with a certain color. Those are vectors. These are bitmap images, JPEG, PNG, GIF, and we're just storing what color you know, each pixel is. So the last piece of information which comes in here is bit depth. Bit depth. Sometimes also color depth is how you hear about it. So let's go uh, color depth wiki. Okay, so we saw this last week, right? So here's the color depth of, you know, so basically what are we asking? Oh, I want my dog back. Uh, hot dog costume dog. And images, and large, and there's my taco. Hey, taco. There's a funny YouTube video I saw a long time called Planet of the Bugs, by the way. Seeing this makes me think of. All right, so um, what is bit depth? Here my bit depth is two, because I'm using two bits, two binary digits, to store the color information for each pixel. So let me say that again a little bit more slowly so it sinks in. I'm using, my bit depth here is two, because I'm using two bits, two binary digits. You know, a binary digit is either zero or one. I'm using two binary digits for each pixel to store the color information. So if I'm only using two binary digits for each pixel, if my bit depth, my color depth is two, then my image can only have, you know, be a combination of four possible colors. Because when I have only zero, zero and one, when I, when I have only two, two lights, I can only store four messages. When I have only two lights, I can only store four messages. Right? 
So here, when I have only one light, right, when my bit depth, my color depth, what do they call it? They actually call it color depth. My color depth is one bit. I'm working with black or white. Or I can say it's green and black, like the old IBM monitors, right? When, my, when I only have one bit for each pixel, that's it. It's, it's two colors to make damage. If I've got two bits, I've got four colors. If I've got four bits, I could do 16 colors. Each pixel could be any of 16 possible colors. If I've got eight bits, each pixel could be any of 200. These look better here, sorry. Each pixel can be any of uh, 256 possible colors. And if I have 24 bits, that's my color depth, my bit depth. Each pixel could be any of like 17 million possible colors. So true color when you shoot photography is 24 bits. That's what they say. It's not like God said, and true color shall be. All right. True color is actually true color. <laughs> yeah. So if you have like a picture that has just one or eight bits, can you can you put it on a computer with like 32 bits and have it and make the picture better? Um, if you have a picture that just has eight bits, like a poor quality picture, and put it in uh -huh. and try to okay. So some software can do image enhancement. Some software can do image enhancement. But it's, I, when I hear that question, I start to think of digital photography. And with digital photography, when you take a picture of something, right, uh, depending upon what resolution and what bit depth you use, and in your camera, it might be like fine, super fine, uh, lower quality. They might just be settings, but really what you're doing is like how much data to store for each image. When you've taken a picture, it, you could always throw data away and make the file size smaller, but it's you can't ever go back and let me recapture exactly what that was like and add more data, right? right. right? You can't, oh, what was that color that my computer, my camera, uh, just said it's going to be this color blue, maybe it's a slightly different shade, right. which my camera didn't have as a possibility, you know, or I didn't capture on whatever setting I was on. Yeah. All right. So that's, that's how we capture image data and store image data, or that's how we store image data in zero, as zeros and ones. With, you know, I, I, I use the phrase coding scheme because to me it's just like text. How are we, how are we storing it? As zeros and ones, you know, so that's what it all gets down to. All right, so that's how we store the image data. The thing that gets interesting about that, which you can see, just to go on a little bit more about this, is if we have that dog picture, yay, and the resolution is 1776 times, and I think I did this last week in here, did I? 1776 times 1753, then we are, we are working with 3 million pixels. So if we have a bit depth of 1, we're storing 3 million and 3.1 million, uh, we're storing 3.1 million zeros and ones. That's with a bit depth of 1. If we, have a, if we do this in true color, we're storing 74.7 million zeros and ones. 74.7 million zeros and ones. Okay? And we could figure out what that is and instead of bits, we could say, hey, let's divide that by, by eight and we could find bytes and then divide it by a thousand, we could find kilobytes and divide by another thousand, we could find megabytes.